have a report. Military strikes near? Maybe. Meanwhile, producing the evidence, the Allies get proof bin Laden was behind the terror as the U.S. gets more support for a military strike. Defense Secretary Rumsfeld heads overseas to shore up some shaky partners. Growing outbreaks of anti-American fever in Pakistan, a country critical to U.S. plans, and warnings about possible new terror strikes against U.S. targets in Europe. This is the CBS Evening News, with Dan Rather reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York. Good evening. The United States Today showed NATO partners evidence tying Osama bin Laden to the attack on America. This came as planning moves ahead for a military strike back in Afghanistan, possibly elsewhere, and possibly reasonably soon, but no one knows. President Bush is still not saying when a strike might come. However, evidence appears that it may well be coming soon. Our coverage begins with CBS's John Roberts at the White House. From the Oval Office in Around the Globe today, signs that President Bush's coalition is mobilizing to strike out against bin Laden, and clear signals that for the Taliban, the time to hand him over is running short. They um, must do so, otherwise there will be a consequence. Mr. Bush continues to say there is no calendar for an American attack, but across the Atlantic, preparing Europe for what appears to be inevitable, if not imminent action, Britain's Prime Minister today issued what could only be considered an ultimatum. And I say to the Taliban, surrender the terrorists or surrender power. That is your choice. The blunt declaration was the strongest indication yet that President Bush is willing to topple Afghanistan's rulers to get bin Laden. Russian President Putin today reaffirmed his support for American military action. And the unified front among U.S. allies drew even tighter today after a top-secret briefing in which the White House laid out the case against al-Qaeda to NATO's Secretary General. The information presented points conclusively to an al-Qaeda rule in the 11th of September attacks. Though the White House maintains it will not choose who rules Afghanistan, America and its allies today pledged if the Taliban falls in the war to get bin Laden, the West will work to restore stability with a broadly based government Afghanis and the region can live with. The conflict will not be the end. We will not walk away as the outside world has done so many times before there. Taliban today complained that President Bush will neither negotiate with them nor show them evidence of bin Laden's guilt. The White House spokesman today said the president does not address Taliban complaints. Dan? John Roberts at the White House. Preparing the American people and NATO for what's to come is one thing. Quite another is holding together the shaky, in some cases very shaky, coalition in and around the Middle East. That is the goal of a new high-level U.S. mission, as CBS's David Martin reports. Defense Secretary Rumsfeld leaves tonight on a hurry-up trip to countries where the U.S. hopes to base forces for strikes against Afghanistan and Osama bin Laden. The stops he plans to make highlight both the strengths and weaknesses of the military plan he is developing. Uzbekistan, right now perhaps the single biggest weakness. Uzbekistan shares a rugged border with Afghanistan and has several large abandoned air bases once used by the Soviet Union. It is an obvious staging area for operations inside Afghanistan. But despite the sight of this unidentified C-130 landing at one of those airfields, U.S. officials say the government of Uzbekistan wants legal and financial assurances before it allows U.S. combat forces to operate there. Given their, uh, their geography and their uh, situation that uh, having a face-to-face -face meeting with the leadership there would be a useful thing. Saudi Arabia, the biggest and best base for American warplanes anywhere in the Middle East. The U.S. has built a state-of-the-art command center here which could be used to direct combat operations against Afghanistan, if the Saudis allow it. Oman, a crucial support base for any operation which calls for inserting ground troops into Afghanistan. With aircraft carriers and amphibious ships positioned off the coast of Pakistan, special operations forces could be flown from the U.S. to Oman and then transferred to the ships from which they could take off for Afghanistan. 
One important country Rumsfeld does not plan to visit is Pakistan, which is already contending with anti-American protests. U.S. officials say the last thing Pakistan needs right now is a high-profile visit by the American Secretary of Defense. Dan? David Martin at the Defense Department. In the Afghan capital today, the Taliban put their military might on display. Soviet tanks and rocket launchers left over from the 1980s rolled through the center of Kabul like some dusty echo of a May Day parade in Red Square. Of greater concern to U.S. war planners is some anti-American fury in neighboring Pakistan. How much is difficult to judge, as CBS's Alan Pizzi reports from the border town of Quetta. The police had warned that the demonstration would be dangerous for foreigners, especially Americans. But the target of anger was as much the Pakistani government as it was the United States. Shouts of Afghanistan is America's graveyard, mixed with cries calling Pakistani leader General Perez Musharraf Washington's dog. The march was organized by a pro-Taliban religious party. And the Afghan ambassador showed up later to make an appeal for what he termed negotiation instead of war. But symbols the marchers waved were a sharp reminder of the problems facing the anti-terrorism alliance between Washington and Islamabad. This is the kind of opposition to which the Pakistani authorities have to pay attention. These people are not just political opponents of the government, they are also tribally and culturally affiliated with the Taliban, and their vows to fight in a jihad cannot be treated as hollow. The faithful were told that the whole thing is a Jewish orchestrated conspiracy against Muslims. Sometimes one lie is told, Malana Fazl or Rahman says, sometimes another. As absurd as that may seem to outsiders, it makes perfect sense to this crowd. More than 60% of Pakistanis are illiterate. Students at religious schools in this area spend their first five years studying only one book, the Quran. And the teachers they revere are convinced it gives them ultimate power. We think that America will find here a very tough resistance. That resistance may be more vocal than physical at the moment, but here, religion is both a weapon and an enemy. Alan Pizzi, CBS News, Quetta. If and when the United States and its allies do take military action inside Afghanistan, even limited small unit action, they will face one foe no army has defeated in thousands of years, the Afghan land itself, mountainous, in some places glacial, and almost everywhere wild. And that was vividly illustrated today as CBS's Elizabeth Palmer reports from the harsh high country of northern Afghanistan. The suffocating sandstorm that blew up today makes it hard to breathe and impossible to see. It's wrapped the battle on this front in choking clouds of dust. And it shows how the most powerful weapon in the Taliban's arsenal is a deadly combination of climate and terrain. Baking deserts. Towering mountains cut through with narrow gorges tailor-made to ambush advancing armies. Caves and crevices perfect for concealing weapons or fighters. This is where the opposition United Front can play a crucial role in the looming military operation here. Their first-hand familiarity with the land, their adaptation to heat and dizzying altitude, and their knowledge of the whereabouts of thousands of landmines could prove invaluable to Western forces. Every road is a potential death trap because all of the roads are overlooked by uh, mountains. And the Russians found out, as they said, that anything that is wheeled or armor just doesn't get anywhere. It simply gets hit. It's a harsh landscape that helped to defeat the British Army in the 19th century and routed the Soviets in the 20th. Unencumbered by tanks or trucks, tough Mujahideen fighters traveled fast and light, using these mountains to great tactical advantage. The old Soviet tank carcasses that litter Afghanistan are a sobering reminder that the last superpower to fight a war in this country was utterly defeated by a lethal combination of Afghan fighters and the cruelest terrain on earth. Elizabeth Palmer, CBS News, Koksha River, Afghanistan. The U.S. State Department today renewed a warning to Americans overseas saying it has specific information that in the next month terrorists may target, quote, symbols of American capitalism in Italy. And as CBS's Tom Fenton reports tonight, there is mounting evidence of similar plots elsewhere in Europe. Following a number of recent arrests, French investigators say they now have proof that a top deputy of Osama bin Laden ordered attacks on American targets in Paris. Jamal Begal, now in French custody, 
told investigators he received instructions to plan a new terrorist operation during a trip to Afghanistan in March, although Begal's lawyer said tonight his client now denies receiving such orders. According to French investigators, the plan called for a man strapped with explosives to enter the American embassy and blow himself up. And the minivan packed with explosives was to be detonated outside the American Cultural Center. As the global reach of the bin Laden network becomes clearer, authorities have found links between Jamal Begel and other terrorist suspects recently arrested in the Netherlands, Belgium and Britain. What seemed to be a series of random arrests may be the first signs of progress in the war on terror. What we're seeing on the surface is a lot of activity uh, that appears to be uncoordinated, but beneath the surface you can see that there is uh, a management style behind it. A style that includes a growing FBI presence overseas. In fact, the FBI has beefed up its presence in a number of places around the world. 30 of its international offices are now actively pursuing leads, including here in Germany, where about a dozen agents are working with German investigators. Tom Fenton, CBS News, Hamburg, Germany. President Bush's top economic advisor, Glenn Hubbard, today became the first administration official to flat out predict a recession. To try to boost the wounded economy, the Federal Reserve today cut interest rates again by half a point. This is the second cut since the terror attacks. It touched off a, wild, a Wall Street rally. The Dow gained 113 points, the Nasdaq about 12. CBS's Anthony Mason is on the market watch tonight. No walk to work today, Alan Greenspan swept into the Federal Reserve in a tinted limousine. A cautious move and another rate cut from the Fed chairman, who's worried the economy may be crippled by cautious consumers. I'm not as worried having seen our results the past 10 days. Marvin Gerard, CEO of Pier One, saw encouraging signs at his 900 stores. You see it with the other color. Where holiday merchandise is suddenly hot. And we had the strongest weekend we've had time for time in about three years. People really came back shopping. But when it came to car and truck buying, consumers slammed on the brakes in September. Sales at Detroit's big three all slumped. Not as badly as many feared, but with 0% financing, many automakers were giving money away. But even with the Fed offering cheaper money, many businesses are reluctant to spend. A survey of major companies last week found 53% now plan to cut investments in new technology by an average of 13%. When I cut back on my expenses as a result of tough times, that's someone else's revenues. David Patrick of Charles Schwab says with stock transactions slowing, his retail brokerage is cutting back spending in new technology too. We're in that cycle where businesses and people uh, would rather save money than invest or spend money. That's going to change when people view some sense of optimism having returned, and we're not there yet. With its ninth cut this year, the Fed's overnight lending rates are now the lowest they've been since the Kennedy administration. That may make borrowing cheaper, but it can't force anyone to take out a loan. Dan? Anthony Mason, thanks. Coming up next here on the CBS Evening News, how U.S. support for Afghan fighters 20 years ago 